So I ask you these questions. This was taken from a lot of this stuff is, my, is research, and I just borrow it from other professors that do it. What if that Holocaust never stopped for its crown's victims? What if there was no glorious vindication, validation, armies or police to come in to save the day and say, what we are doing is wrong? What if the status quo is, this is the way it's going to be because I, as government, say so? Don't question it, I said this, and it has to be true. What if those that resisted were further isolated, crushed, ostracized, or jailed for resisting this movement? And I think this one is a pretty big important one because that's what we deal with today. What if the Crown's own vision, the Crown's own principles of those same people were accepted wholeheartedly without question by its own citizens. What if all of this happened? What would we do today in today's society? Because what we did in the past isn't what we do probably today. It's what you've just witnessed was Canada's policy towards the Aboriginal people of this country that led up to the Indian residential school system trying to change a race of people into something that they deemed civilized. I get asked one question all the time. Probably most of my work is with non-Aboriginal audiences, and I think it's important because they really don't understand this history either. They're taught one thing, and they believe that one thing. And that question is, or statement for that matter is, why can't you people just join our society, our country already, and just get over it? That was 150 years ago. Get over it. Don't you think it's about time? <laughs> well, how can you get over something that wasn't 150 years ago, but 150 years of continually implementing and making sure these policies and legislations were at the forefront so that these people did not have a chance to be a part of this society. The last school to close its doors in this country was in 1996. So it's not an old history. It's something we're still dealing with at this very moment. For me, as an intergenerational survivor, I've done a lot of work for myself to get to where I'm at today. So I can say, I am over it. I'm just working on trying to be me now and be something, uh, the better part of me. Our intergenerational youth that are sitting in front here, they probably don't even understand why some of the behaviors or language or anything else for that matter is the way it is at home. Because these schools, these people that were supposed to keep them safe, supposed to teach them how to be a contributing member of society, was supposed to teach them how to have empathy, love, and protection, were the same people that were harming them in the most horrific ways that you could possibly think of. So what do you think happens to these survivors once they leave this school? They don't have parenting skills. They have no self-worth. What's going to happen to them? One survivor I work with said to me quite simply, he goes, when I was seven years old, he was five when he got put in, and he said his punishments began almost immediately, and he says, I, don't, I didn't say I go to school for eight years. He said, I served eight years. Big difference in when you're going to school and when you're actually serving time. And he says, how could I be a good person in today's society? when these nuns were making me commit all of these moral sins, what made it worse is they were people of God, and we were still committing these sins to these people of God. So I knew I was destined for hell. Because so when I was 15 and I got out, he says, why bother be good in the first place? Because I wasn't going to do anything. I wasn't worthy enough to get into heaven. So that's what we're dealing with here. 
It's something we can't just get over when our memories are still sitting in this room, living it on a day-to-day -day basis like it was yesterday. And just because you see this face that is in their 70s or 80s or 60s, even 50s for that matter, in some cases, late 40s, we forget that they were once children that were there. Those faces were once little ones that we call precious to this day and we actually embrace and protect to the fullest extent that we can. The apology started coming down in 86 with the United Church. They did two apologies. They did one 10 years later. Their first apology was so vague that they were afraid of having any repercussions from what they may have said. So their second apology was a lot more sincere and a lot more detailed. 91, the Royal Catholic Oblates of Mary Immaculate. 93, the Anglican, Presbyterian in 94, and the big one of 2008, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. What does sorry mean? For some survivors, it was enough to say, that's all I need, that's all I want, I can move on with my life. For others, they said, Sorry, I will never accept because they took far too much from me and my family and my ability to be a human being in this country. If you actually do your own research and actually YouTube um, Jack Layton, his apology was a lot more sincere. This apology came down not from Prime Minister Stephen Harper. It came down through the, through the mandate and the just wanting to make things right was the late Jack Layton. We have yet to receive a formal apology from the Catholic Church, yet they actually did 70% of the schools in this country. This is just one church, one member of the church, that whole Catholic system. And this is, um, what is an intergenerational survivor? What is the impact that is left to this day? These are what your teachers, the teacher's aides, the cultural workers, the tutors, you guys are dealing with to this day. And this isn't an Aboriginal definition. This is a definition that can be used across the board. When anybody experiences or witnesses a trauma in their, in their lives and that trauma or isn't dealt with, you unknowingly, through your actions, through your words, through your behaviors, pass on something that you thought you were keeping them safe from. That silence in that school, our survivors were told, who are you going to tell? Who are they going to believe? I'm a man of God. You're nothing but an Indian. Whose voice are they going to believe? So these schools silenced our survivors and thinking that they, our survivors thought they were keeping us safe, unknowingly was harming us in different ways. Not by choice, because that's what they had to do to survive themselves. These are some of the impacts that we deal with on a daily basis. We as an Aboriginal society are the fastest growing population in this country. In 2006, our population by stats can was about 800,000 Aboriginal people in this country. By 2011, we are now 1.1 million and growing rapidly. We are only 3.9% of the Canadian population, yet we inundate all of the social services this country has to offer. Of that 1.1 million, 55% of that 1.1 million is under the age of 25. It's a lot of youth that we're trying to contend with, that are still dealing with these. The symptoms of survivors and intergenerational survivors are almost exactly the same. I did not go to residential school, but residential school did come home to me. And we lived it daily, not knowing what that history was. We have the highest rate per capita for the misuse of alcohol and drugs. <laughs> the funny part is, well, we were prohibited from even having alcohol or possessing it until I know in Vancouver they said about the 1960s. Yet that's the stereotype that we are led to believe. 
you're nothing but a drunken, dirty Indian. We have the highest rate per capita of this country to babies being born to fetal alcohol syndrome and narcotics. We also have, in our households, normalized vision of how things should be. Normalized violence, normalized dysfunction, no self-worth. Parenting skills are not there. We also have the highest rate per capita in this country for suicides under the age of 35. If you're Aboriginal, that rate goes up. If you, just because you're born Aboriginal, that rate goes up two to six times higher if you are Aboriginal. You're at risk of committing suicide two to six times greater. If you're Inuit, that goes up to 10 times greater than the average, average population. See, I look at this and I say, that's where I came from. Because I grew up in a household of alcoholic, alcoholics and violence. Especially if you're on a reserve, all of a sudden, it's not just your household, it's all of your extended family around your household. I'm the oldest of many, many grandchildren on my dad's side, 32, I believe. And being the oldest comes with a lot of unwritten rules and responsibilities. I actually became the protector for many of my siblings and my cousins. Because when you're young, you have to grow up more quickly than you actually anticipate. And because I went through all of this, and my family hit it really well. Because about 10 years ago, I was talking to my neighbor who lived next door, and she says, I always wanted to be a part of your family because your family always seemed to be so happy and you always, you didn't go through what I went through. And I'm like, so I looked at her and I went, no, this is what we went through. And she goes, wow, I didn't realize you guys went through it. I guess we were perceived the Brady Bunch on, on the res. But when I left, when I turned of age, I said, enough is enough, I'm out of here. You people are too chaotic and I'm gone. Except when I left, it was like I was jumping out of the frying pan into the fire pit because I didn't do any of this healing. I didn't move to where I thought I was in a good place. So I got married, had kids very young, and my ex-husband and I had a very, very uh, dysfunctional life best way I can describe it is, I always say, I'm the Ike and Tina Turner of the res. And, you know, not for any other reason that it's just because I went through it, he went through it, we chose not to drink, but we still lived an alcoholic lifestyle. It was dry, mind you, but it was still the same. So I would be holding a match, he would be holding the dynamite, and together, wow, would fireworks fly. <laughs> very, very, very volatile. So between 1990 to 2003, that was my life. I had three kids. And of course, we had toxic communication, internalized inferiority, taking back that passive aggressive nature by saying, by pushing him down to make myself feel better. I would also come home at the end of a day and I'd push his buttons to the point where I knew what the end result was going to be, yet I did continue to do it. I could take care of myself in my 20s. If you ask any res girl back in the day, we could take care of ourselves in any situation. Whether you're fe female or male, we were born to be tough. We were told, you don't cry in public. You're strong. What's wrong with you? So we never showed emotion. We actually boxed it up really nice and neat and tidy. And that was the last fight that we had in 2000. And when my daughters were all under the age of 10. And it was such a volatile fight that it was something that we never encountered before either. He knocked me out. I saw stars because I would hit the corner of the wall. And as I was falling down the stairs, I, 
still that res mentality. I'm like, you SOB. <laughs> I, if I'm going down, you're coming with me. And I grabbed him, and I, we fell down the stairs together. The only difference is, once we hit the bottom of the stairs, I thought, maybe I'll get the better situation. But no, he got the better situation, and something in his eyes changed. He wasn't there anymore. It was darkness, blackness. He was there physically, but he wasn't there emotionally or spiritually or mentally. And he started choking me. And as I was blacking out, if anyone's ever been blacked out in their entire life, knows what that feeling is, and it comes down to a pinpoint. And we thought we were hiding it well from our kids, and of course we weren't. And I, before I blacked out, I saw my three daughters at the top of the stairs. They were crying and saying, Mommy, Daddy, please stop. Don't hurt Mommy. Well, just before I blacked out, Something hit me in my head that I said, and not him, it was me, <laughs> was I need to change things now. Because if I don't change my circumstances, I was giving my daughters permission that this, is, this lifestyle is OK. That it's OK to treat people this way, and it's OK to be treated this way. Well, I'm a little bit of a slow learner. Three years later, I left. <laughs> But I did leave. And I've had some three major reconciliations in my life. That's where I've healed myself to a point where I felt good enough to say a few things. One was, the first one was with my daughter, who's 22 now. And she said to me, Mom, actually she calls me Ma. <laughs> Ma, I've always loved you, but I really like you now. And I went, this was a few years ago, so she's, I was like, thanks, because I wasn't sure what she would meant, really meant by that. And she says, wait, let me explain just a little bit. And she goes, see, I knew you back when you were really angry. I knew when would anybody would say anything or do anything to you, you would react and get so angry you would defend yourself or anyone else for that matter, not in a good way. She says, and then you left, and then you started changing. And she goes, and today, there is not anything wrong that comes in our way, in our household, where you actually let it bring you down anymore. You never let it affect you negatively anymore. That meant something more to me than anything. Because that was something that meant I did something right. For once in my life, I did something right. Then I talked to my 16-year-old this past, I think it was New Year's Eve. And, she, and I happened to spend time with her on New Year's Eve because my kids, when I left the res, if you actually leave the res, you're living on your husband's reserve. So when you break up, well, you can't stay there. It's not yours. So I had to leave. And I left with my kids with my ex-husband because he may have been ugly to, like we may not have been able to do anything together, but he was an amazing father. He would do anything for them. And so when I left the reserve, I, I consciously said, this is where they're going to want to stay. This is where they want to be, because this is their friends, family, school. You're in high school. You're not going to want to leave your friends, because it's too hard to make new ones. So I left. And I left two and a half hours away, and I'd only see them on weekends. But that was my choice, because I had to do what was best for them, not what I wanted. And in that situation, she, as she's like, Mom, I just want to go out. And I'm like, you're not going out. And she goes, what, you don't trust me? And I'm like, I trust you. I don't trust anybody else out there because we were on another reserve, my sister's reserve, where she's living. And she goes, well, OK, we won't go out. But can I go to 7-Eleven? And I said, I'll drive you to 7-Eleven. And she goes, oh my god. She's like, you are such a mean mom. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not mean. I'm just being a mom. And thankfully, I did. Because that was the community that, where that young girl that was just walking home at night went from one place to another, and she went missing, and they found her body burned up by the cemetery. I didn't want that to even become a part of a fate or destiny for my kids. And that night, there was two stabbings. Three people were admitted to the hospital for having bottles broken over their heads. There was somebody that was thrown through a plate glass window and it was all within the vicinity of where we were. 
And that's why I did not let her go out. Because she doesn't see me as being a mean mom. She only knows me today. And my oldest daughter always says, you do not want to see mom angry. And I'm like, what, am I the Hulk? <laughs> I don't turn green or anything. I'm just, you know, that's the way I used to be. And I'm not saying that this is where we have to stay. I'm not saying that this is our destiny for an eternity, for a lifetime. Because change, for me, was a choice. It was my daughters that I chose to change. If our youth are our future, well then we better start showing them that they are our future. 55% of them are under the age of 25, so we have to be able to be there for them, to support them, put that light in their eye that they can achieve anything and everything they have their mind set to, and not just become that residual, I'm just going to be another welfare recipient. Because we didn't have welfare back in the day, we actually sustained ourselves. Through forgiveness was the biggest defeat for me, where I was able to finally look in the mirror and say, I actually like this person a little bit. I don't hate her as much anymore. I actually like her. I don't love her yet, but eventually I'll get there. And despite all of that negativity, we have a larger number of going to school and finishing grade 12 and going to university. And I have to say thank Karen for making me aware that your school district is you know, in the top five or three of the best graduating students of Aboriginal students in, the, in this district. And that's thanks to people like you. You're creating a chance for them. You're giving them a future, a future they did not see before. We also have the highest per capita in this country of young entrepreneurs. They're not sitting on their butts saying, what are you going to give me? They're saying, I am going to take control of my life and I am going to do something better for me and my family. And as you witnessed this morning, our youth are taking back that culture and that pride. That was something that was taken away from them. And they're saying, not anymore. This is who I am and this is who I'm going to be, like it or not. This presentation is not about the guilt or the shame. I'm not here to say, this is yours, now own it. It's just about providing facts of what happened through our history. And what you do with it and how you utilize it in a positive or negative way is entirely up to you. I'm not here to change anyone's minds. I'm just here to provide the information and leave it to you to do with it. In my culture, It'd be like me standing up here and saying, I don't speak for myself, I don't speak for my family. I am going to give you 50 cents and you're going to become my voice from here on out. You are now officially my witnesses. And you're here to document this history. 2005 was the settlement agreement. It was implemented in 2005 and negotiated through the AFN, um, the churches and the Department of Justice. Five components, compensation, which are all expired. They expired in September 19th, 2011 and 2012. Health supports, which is available for all survivors. If you are a survivor, you know what school you went to, you know your birth date, you can actually phone Health Canada number and get unlimited amounts of counseling for you. If you are an intergenerational survivor, you call that number, 1-800-CANADA number, Say, this is the survivor I lived with, this is the school they went to, this is their birth date, and they will be given a certain amount, a limited amount of counseling. But at least it's there. Maybe it's all they need. The healing fund has expired, and that expired about two years ago. Commemoration fund, which was open and is now expired as well, if you notice the theme here is if it's all expiring and coming to an end. That was for anybody and anybody who wanted to engage in commemorating our survivors that attended these schools. And the only Truth and Reconciliation Commission to take place in Canadian history, or even on, this, on our soil. The only difference with this commission is, that unlike Rwanda, they had teeth to say, this person committed this crime, they must stand trial. 
Here it's about educating and keeping, that, keeping those stories alive and documented in one central location, which I do believe is probably going to be in Winnipeg. Out of that settlement agreement, there are 133 schools that were approved, operated, or run by the federal government as well as the churches. I'm not saying these are the only schools. These are the only ones the federal government had any say in. And it has been increasing since I've been there. It started at 128, and I do believe, and it's now at 133. So I end here with asking the same questions. What was that Indian problem? Why was it a problem and whose problem was it? In the United States, they dealt with their Indian problem slightly differently. At first, it was the Indian Wars, and they'd go through the total annihilation process. When that annihilation process didn't work, they moved on to the food source, the buffalo. This was taken at the University of Kansas in 1884, and it says, when one Indian boy or girl leaves the school with in education, the Indian problem will forever be solved for him and his children. The only difference is in the states why they went through possibly education was an economist once said to them, these Indian wars are costly. It costs one million dollars to send one soldier out to kill one Indian, whereas we can educate them for twelve hundred dollars for an eight-year period. So that's how the residential schools came about down there. We have no control of our past except acknowledging, validating, and ensuring that that voice gets heard from this point forward. Because for me, my beacon of hope was a darn guidance counselor that I absolutely despised in grade eight. But he stuck with me all the way up to grade 12. And he always seemed to pull me out of school, my one class, and that was English. And he'd always say, how are you doing today? And I'm like, can I go back to class? <laughs> when you're in grade eight, who wants to go back to English, especially if you're running? Well, you do if you want to run away from your guidance counselor. <laughs> but he proved I could do something. He made me see that I could actually join organized sports. I was probably the only Aboriginal person back in that day on, in organized sports, soccer, volleyballs. Basketball was my sport of the day. And it's tough. It's tough to be the only brown person in, in something like that. The funny thing is, is, one story that I like to share is when I was in high school, we, we left the districts down in Victoria and got back really late because we were in the finals. And so the bus driver said, we're going to drop those that are in the south end off before we get to the north end. So I was in the south end, which I was probably the only one in the far south end because that's where they moved our reserve. And as soon as we started going on the reserve, the rest of my teammates were like, oh my god, are we going to be safe? Are we going to be safe? Like, is this OK? Are we allowed to be down here? Me being as the cheeky person I am, I started playing into their fears. Well, if you're 14, 13, you are going to be a little cheeky. And I started saying, well, you know, because I'm here with you right now, you are safe. The moment you drop me off, you should just get the hightail it out of here, not stop for anything, and once you get off the boundaries of the reserve, you'll be safe. Of course, they sped out of there like uh, crazy. 